Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a real gift for me to be among you on this day. As a young pastor serving at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Phoenix, I remember the ministry of, of Pastor Wallace and the vibrant ministries that you had as American Lutheran Church. And there is a scholarship, in fact, that bears his name and that many students have been able to complete their education at a Lutheran university because of these gifts. And over the years, in fact, 40 years, your congregation has supported Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley and the university in Thousand Oaks with financial gifts of a little under $400,000. That's a lot of money. They thank you for this support. And in behalf of President Chris Kimball, I thank you for your partnership in the gospel and for your prayers and for your advocacies for all the colleges and universities of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's good to be among you. It happened one morning about 7.51 there, it happened in Washington, D.C. at a metro station. Workers were going to work, were getting on the subways and the trains. And for 43 minutes, there was a violinist perched at the top of the metro station playing beautiful music. About 1,907 people passed by. And nobody knew it, but that fiddler playing was one of the finest classical musicians that the world had ever known, playing some of the most beautiful classical music ever played on one of the most expensive violins in the world. What do you think happened? Would people pass by and notice? Well, the Washington Post wanted to find out, so they put cameras up around the whole area and they watched. 43 minutes. It was three minutes before somebody stopped, and by stopped I meant just kind of looked over to watch Joshua Bell play. At the end, seven people stopped to observe and listen and take in this beautiful music, and about $32 were given, and they threw it in his uh, violin case. That leaves 1,070 people who hurried by not paying attention to the beautiful music that they could have received for free when most people can't even afford the tickets to his concerts. They weren't paying attention. The lesson recorded in Luke's Gospel speaks to us about paying attention. Jesus has been teaching in the temple and he observes what is happening. He noticed people with very fine robes, deep in it, deep dipping into their pockets and pulling out large coins and throwing them into the treasury bowl. He also noticed when an older widow, you could barely hear the little clink, clink of two little copper coins. Jesus pays attention. Jesus testifies to what he sees and hears others he says, has given out of their abundance, but she, she has given out of her poverty, out of all she has to live upon. And then he begins to teach the people who hear him. He tells them of a time that seems like cosmic upheaval. Beautiful sanctuaries like this are just decimated to the ground. Wars and insurrections happen and people are torn asunder by plagues and earthquakes. Oh my, I wonder if I was listening to Jesus, would I think he was talking maybe about the very end of the world? It reminds me of the words of the poet William Butler Yeats when he pens, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And then in the midst of these apocalyptic upheavals and divisions of great proportion, Jesus says something truly shocking or at least it's shocking to me, he says, this will give you an opportunity to testify. Oh my, when all that is happening, my response is to testify? 
what is he saying to us? This troublemaker, this reformer, this justice maker, calling us, calling you and me to testify when we see upheaval in the world. Well, it begs the question, doesn't it? To what are we paying attention to today? To what do we testify? You may be aware that last year, in November of 2018, was a time of great trouble at California Lutheran University. On the night of November 7th, at the Borderline Bar and Grill, it was college night, and students from Pepperdine and the Cal States and Cal Lutheran were spending Wednesday night country line dancing in this bar. And a gunman entered, he was there for well over an hour. At the end, 12 people were killed, including a, a first responder police officer. Some of our students, a lot of Cal Lutheran students like the country line dance, uh, were breaking the windows with chairs and pushing each other out. Some of them were underneath the place where they were running the music. One of our students was on top, he said, of about four students. Others were hiding in the bathroom, trying to be very quiet because they could hear the gunshots happening over time. One of the deceased was a recent Kowloon alum. Everybody knew him. He was in the choir, he was in the quartets, he was in drama, he was really a rowdy fan at the football games. And at that day, it felt like our whole community was being ripped apart in grief. And then things got worse much worse. There were two fires that came around the university, the Woolley and the Hill Fire, and while the university was just fine and we were never in peril, we had to shut down and members of our community's homes were, um, were just burned to the ground. Classes were canceled and members of the community were displaced. We could hardly catch our breath from our grief when this fire came around and enveloped it. Can I testify to something? I want to testify to the amazing outpouring of generosity from Lutheran disaster relief. When you give your offering today, some of that morning is going to Lutheran disaster relief to help communities like ours. I want to tell you that Lutheran Social Service called, I mean, like eight hours after the fire started. How can we come alongside of you, Cal Lutheran, bringing emotional support, counselors, and financial support? I want to tell you about local clergy who got on their collars and just walked on our campus. They would come up to strangers and say, tell me what happened. And students and faculty and staff alike would pour out their souls. I want to tell you about people came with brown boxes full of bananas. I think when you're in stress, you need a lot of potassium. And then here come mountains, boxes of pizza and bottles of water. People brought therapy horses and therapy goats and therapy animals of all kinds. I want to tell you about the students who crammed into the Samuelson Chapel that morning, uh, just hours after the shooting, and when we had a time of question, question and answer, the first question that they said was, we want to start a blood drive. And they did that, and for the few hours that we were still open, some of them also gathered food that they had and brought it to our local fire station. I want to tell you and testify to the 700 Lutheran and Episcopal churches that sent us prayer shawls and quilts just like these. It was for a few weeks after that time where we would bring them outside Starbucks and students and faculty and workers would, would wrap themselves in this love. Some of them said to me, why would anybody do this? And I could testify that the church knows that God loves you and cares for you, and they want you to know that they do too. 
Some of the churches sent us bulletins with little arrows saying, we prayed for you, and they circled and highlighted praying for Cal Lutheran at this time. May I testify to something else? Two weeks later, picketers from Westboro Baptist Church came to Thousand Oaks. They were outraged, and they sent this manifesto out by social media. They said this, God sent the shooter. They were outraged that our high school had an LGBTQ club. They were outraged that our high school had a Catholic student organization. They were outraged that our high school had a mental health club. They used their voice to tell our city that God sent the shooter. Now, I realize that there may be all kinds of different ways to respond to voices of hate when they come into your community, and there are many ways that I think are appropriate. Some people want to ignore them with great conviction because they don't want the media attention to go to them. Some people host a counter party event at the same time. You know what? There are all kinds of churches that had pancake breakfast at that same time, hoping that the attention would be diverted there. And other people decided to go right to the high school and stage a counter protest so that to those voices of hate, there would be a different voice heard. Well, I wrestled with what my response should be. I, I prayed. I talked to the president of the university, my boss. I asked for his wise counsel. Do you know what he told me? It, it just blew me away. I heard his testimony when he said, Melissa, you're right. If you go out, you will represent the university. When you speak, you speak our voice. Yet I want you to know that you have a higher calling. You have a higher calling as a minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and as a Christian. Melissa, use your voice so that people will hear the voice of God. And so I did. I spent time with Cal Lutheran students making posters for the counter protest and then we talked together about, when they were there, how not to engage in hate, but to stand centered and focused in their own convictions. I think it was holy time. I also spent time with students, coffee shop and in our dining commons, wrestling with the question, could it be that God really would send a shooter? Why do bad things happen to good people? I think that was holy time. And when the Westboro Baptist Church was at the high school, I joined a lot of Lutheran clergy. We collared up too when we had signs. And we were with youth workers and people from the temples and our mosque. We were standing together, voicing God's love and welcome for all people. I think all of us, in a way, were walking Jesus' values. We were testifying to Jesus' way of living, values of peace over violence and forgiveness over revenge. You can imagine how hard that was for us. Values of love over hate and values of coming together as a community to be a place where we see the good for our neighbors. Everybody that day who was testifying, I think we're saying, that when it looks like our world is in time of great upheaval, that people are torn apart at the seam, God's love is greater than our separation. When the world seems inside out and turns upside down, God's people stand firm to resist evil and division wherever it is found and work towards justice and welcome and the flourishing of all. I think you, as members of American Lutheran Church, know something about that. I've read some of your literature about your outreach efforts. I've heard about that bazaar and how you are raising money to help campus uh, Lutheran campus ministry at the three universities in your state. I know that you are doing grief ministry and you are caring for your friends. 
And I think you testify when you do more than just wring your hands about the future of the next generation and you send scholarship dollars to raise up pastors for this church, for ministry in the church and the world. Your generosity is going to generate ministry for years to come. Now, I want you to know that this calling that we have from Jesus is not easy. It's not going to be easy to bring love to places of hostility in the world. Jesus didn't minimize this. He spoke truth. He talked about wars and insurrections. But he said, use this opportunity, disciples, to testify. Tell the story. Testify. Testify to what you see and hear. Testify in your relationships to the amazing love of God. Tell others how you see God order out of chaos and love out of hate. Testify. Listen up. Pay attention. Testify the disarming love of God which propels us to work in the world for the sake of our neighbor and out of our freedom in Christ. Amen.